in genetic modification of organisms using the combinant DNA technology, we have talked about how to extract the gene from the organisms. We have talked about what vectors are commonly used. And the final thing we have to cover here is how do we identify the genetically modified organisms when we have inserted the gene into their cells. You see, in my case over here, as an example, you have the recombinant plasmid with the gene and also the promoter. I've explained why the promoter has to be included, by the way. The promoter needs to be present so that the gene can be expressed with RNA polymerase. As you can see here, we have a few recombinant plasmids. We try to insert the recombinant plasmids into the bacteria. As you can see here, only one of the bacteria have successfully taken up the recombinant plasmid. How do we identify the genetically modified bacteria? Some students will say, oh, very simple. We just look at it under the microscope. But here's the thing. When you look at it under the microscope, all the bacteria look exactly the same. Okay. Some students will say, oh, but they may have the recombinant plasmid. It is very difficult. It is almost impossible to see recombinant plasmids under light microscope. That's the problem. So, and you can't use electron microscopes because if you want to visualize bacteria using electron microscopes, the bacteria have to be dead. What's the point of the bacteria being dead if you can't make the bacteria produce insulin then? So we need the bacteria alive, by the way. So how then do we identify the genetically modified organisms? The answer to that question is we use something known as gene markers. Gene markers are just genes used to identify GMOs or genetically modified organisms. Remember, your recombinant plasmid is supposed to have the promoter and the gene. For example, in this case, the insulin gene. We also have to include a gene marker. Now, what exactly is a gene marker? There are many different types of genes that can be used as gene markers, but one of the most common gene markers that we use is something known as the GFP gene, also known as the green fluorescent protein gene. Now, what exactly is the green fluorescent protein gene or the GFP gene? And how does it act as a gene marker? Now, as you can see here, oh, if you notice, I use the word gene marker and marker gene interchangeably. It's the same thing. Don't worry about that. So as you can see here in this recombinant plasmid, the recombinant plasmid has a promoter, the insulin gene, which I'm circling to show you where things are, and also the marker gene. They are part of the plasmid. In this case, if the RNA polymerase attaches to the promoter, it is able to move along the plasmid, express the insulin gene to produce the mRNA, and expresses the marker gene to produce a different mRNA. So two mRNAs are produced in this case. Obviously, if this mRNA undergoes translation, it produces the insulin protein. And if that mRNA gets translated in the ribosome, it produces something known as the GFP or the green fluorescent protein. What's the big deal about this green fluorescent protein? This green fluorescent protein is able to glow. So you might be thinking, okay, this is an interesting gene. How does that help me identify genetically modified organisms? Let's look at it again. So now when we are inserting the recombinant plasmid, this recombinant plasmid has three things. It has the promoter, it has the gene, the insulin gene, not gene insulin, by the way, it's the insulin gene. My writing there's a bit off. And then of course, uh, it also has the marker gene, the GFP gene. We insert the recombinant plasmid back into the bacteria. And when we insert it into the bacteria, one of the bacterium, as you can see there, has taken up the plasmid. So this bacterium is able to express not only the insulin gene, it is also able to express the GFP gene, which is the marker gene in this case. So when you look at it under the microscope, you will notice that this bacterium is able to produce insulin proteins and also the green fluorescent protein. Therefore, it is able to glow. And when you look at it under the microscope, you are able to distinguish it from all the other not genetically modified bacteria. So in this case, you're like, found it. And of course, the otter is happy. So in summary, we have done quite a fair bit. 
These were the pertinent questions we wanted to ask. How the genes are obtained? How do we produce many identical copies? What vectors are commonly used? How do we identify the genetically modified organisms, bacteria in this case? So for example, in the production of a genetically modified bacterium, I wanted this bacterium to produce human insulin. Why did I want it to produce human insulin? Because I wanted to, we wanted to treat people who have diabetes. How do we produce this genetically modified bacterium? There are three ways to obtain the gene from the human first. We can cut the insulin gene from the chromosome using restriction endonuclease. We talked about this in the previous video. We can extract the mRNA and convert the mRNA into cDNA using reverse transcriptase and then DNA polymerase to get back the double-stranded DNA. We can also artificially synthesize the gene using a DNA synthesizer if we know the base sequence of the gene and we get the insulin gene. We then cut a plasmid using the same type of restriction endonuclease to get complementary sticky ends. We also attach a promoter and a gene marker, for example, the GFP gene. Using DNA ligase, we attach all these fragments together to get a recombinant plasmid. We insert the recombinant plasmid into the bacterium. Oh, that's a lot. Yeah. And then if the bacterium takes up the recombinant plasmid, the bacterium is able to glow. We, if the bacterium glows, we have identified the genetically modified bacteria using the gene marker. And once we get that bacterium, do we just want one of it? No, we don't. We want as many as possible. So we make the bacterium undergo asexual reproduction. Because when that bacterium reproduces asexually, it will produce identical copies. So if that bacterium can produce human insulin, all its future generation will also be able to produce human insulin. So to answer the question, how are the genes obtained or extracted? You can cut using the cut the chromosome using restriction endonuclease or convert mRNA to gene using reverse transcriptase and DNA polymerase. I did not write the DNA polymerase there. Or you can artificially synthesize it using a DNA synthesizer machine. How do we produce many identical copies of the gene? Polymerase chain reaction. I will talk about it in, I think, the next two videos or so. All right. What vectors are commonly used? plasmids, which are small circular DNA. We use plasmids when we modify bacteria because you can replicate plasmids easily. They have single restriction sites and they are extremely small. We can also use viruses and liposomes as vectors as well. I will talk about that later. And how do we identify the genetically modified bacteria? We use something known as gene markers, which are just GFP genes, for example, GFP genes that can make the genetically modified organisms glow. This is the final part of recombinant DNA technology. But are we done with the chapter? Obviously not.